What is up down and sideways, you beautiful individuals? We are back. It's League on Mark. Eric and Mark here with you. Beauties for a little week six global power ranking action. The LCS and the LEC might not be in action this week, but they can still move around the board a little bit as the LCK and LPL get a big shuffle from top to bottom. Just uh, just enough action, I'll say, in the LCK and the LPL to necessitate going in for another edition of the Global Power Rankings. Even with LCS, LEC in their holding patterns, LEC, you're still maybe, you know, you're getting that second look, a little bit more of a revision back on what we've gone through with the winter split and the, L and the LCS. You're having kind of that outlook of, okay, we've gone through what we already have here in this little bit of our split and what we've got ahead of us. Time to take a little bit of a reshuffling of the global power rank. And first and foremost, you know, we've got a few LPL squads ousted, gone from the top 20. LNG, I'm sorry, guys. We tried to hold out for you. But five in a row, you're out of there. Cloud9 didn't even play, but they're getting pushed back out of the top 20 as well. As we said, they were one fingernail on the edge of the cliff. But that's because Weibo lose to OMG. They get bumped down, and now they're the squad. Fingernails only hanging on the edge of the cliff. And it, it, it's a paging Dr. Shaohu. We need to see you in Where the mid lane at? immediately. Report to the Weibo squad. We've got to see this going on because that is a major power difference when you're looking at this team and they're coming off of a match where light didn't perform as well that's where you start to have these issues and you can see a squad like Weibo finding themselves at the very bottom of these global power D plus ahead of them they climb back it's been I think two weeks since we've had them on this list convincing 2-0 against Fox and then surviving not just DRX but the powers of the internet and the LCK as a whole to survive the seven hour marathon against DRX major props for being able to keep whatever level of focus you did have an execution in that match to get that done across the six to seven hour finish line that that series was. I think Showmaker is one of those players that we can highlight on this D plus roster that has been rising in form alongside, you know, of course, many games on the Azir, certainly seeing a, a healthy dosage of that alongside maybe a little splash of karma as well for Mr. Showmaker. Yeah. Karma mid lane meta is just <laughs> not the world we want to be living in, but it's exactly uh, where we are. BDS didn't play any games, but they get pulled back a little bit. Uh, and that is mainly because we got to make room for some rising LPL squads talking about world elite who have quietly, I think, well overperformed, probably already surpassed the win total. A lot of guys... A lot of people were expecting for them. They lose to JDG, but it is an incredibly competitive three-game set, enough to warrant them climbing onto here. Yeah, this is going to be entering into the conversation. A lot of these LPL teams rising up. This is where you hear that LPL dark horse conversation because we're hovering right around that bottom zone, you know, kind of just entering into the playoffs of the LPL when we're talking about the threats that these squads can represent. World Elite, as you mentioned, rising into that category. Good, strong, competitive showing in that full series against JDG. That's where you see that they've ri risen up to this point. And this ain't this ain't Prince. Remember, we thought Prince is going to come have this big impact on the squad, but we've been seeing uh, not. We're not talking leave. We're talking stay, staying in the bot lane, even though it was a bit of a ruler diffy throughout this series. Uh, overall, this World Elite squad, especially that top side, Mr. Wayward, was popping off this whole series. He's been hearing us talk all about Mr. 369, the replacement, how fantastic of an option it was going to be for top esports. Wayward's reminding a lot of people that I had my moments too. I had some spotlight moments in there, and he's showing it that he's still got it in the LPL. The other LPL team entering that dark horse, bordering on maybe contender, at least making some noise in playoffs. Climbing up four spots is fun, plus Phoenix. Of course, this week highlighted, we call it an absolute dud, brain dead decision out of top esports. But on the flip side, it's a genius macro move out of FPX to trade Nexus for Baron. I'm not quite ready to slap the genius label <laughs> on anything associated with what happened in that game three of that series. There does need to be giving some credit over to FPX to push it to that point where you are in number one at a deciding game three. 
And then two, in that position where you know what, you are capable of making a right decision, right action and execution to make it where it is the enemy nexus blowing up. I don't care what the game state was at that point. Got to give some of those points over to FPX. And as you mentioned, this is it. This is probably one of the front runners of those dark horses in the LPL that you really can look at as a threat for the playoffs. And I mean, the decision, you know, life did have to go interrupt some of these backs. So there was some smart plays that was made out of FPX. And then obviously the guy to look out for in any of these series is Milky Way in the jungle. One of the premier uh, junglers on this FPX squad now. It's a cursed name now, but I'm calling him the modern day Bo. I'm saying it. <laughs> I, I'm not cursing him with any Pre of that. Pre-LEC, though. With how Pre-match fixing. I'm not ready for that <laughs> one yet in the LPL, but you better believe the rest of the LPL, they were not ready for Milky Ways to step in and deliver like he has so far, rising to the cream of the, the top of the cream that we've got for the players in the jungle in the LPL. And there's a couple of young guys, you know, Lian, obviously, Jun, less young now, but a lot of these carry junglers are starting to take over the LPL on a lot of these different Viego, Zin Zhao, even Lee Sin being some of these carry picks. So very excited about this role in particular in the LPL right now. Sandwiched in between those two squads in China is someone that we were so excited about and we're just ready to see them ascend with back-to-back -back matches against OK Savings Bank Brion, and they end up getting O2'd. Do the Kwang Dong freaks to kind of have that hype train not derailed, but uh, it's it's out for repairs right now. Yeah, and it is certainly uh, halting on the brakes, big time, red hot glowing brakes with how quickly we're coming to the stop on the Kwang Dong freak situation with that O2 run against the bros. Yes, that's gonna hurt yourself. It's gonna cost you, especially when you look at what was heading into this series, where the bros were standing and how, where KDF was on the rise. This is absolutely no ifs or ands or buts about it, a mega knockdown in the situation. And I think re really, when you're talking about a couple of these squads that are just below them, one impressive showing, one game, one big play. And I think they're leapfrogging over the Kwangdong freaks at this point. At least, Glass half full kind of guy. It was three games in both the series. They didn't get double 2 0 by the bros. That's by no means what we should be uh, praising Kwang Dong in any way, shape, or form. But the same way we're impressed with uh, D Plus surviving that seven hour marathon, we're almost getting that big asterisk by this second series because they had to play the next day. It was from home. So many strange circumstances. I know both squads had the same thing going on, but I'm not panicking about Kwang Dong. I'm willing to lower, lessen the severe punishment for going 0-2 against the bros as you as you bring that one up, the reminder that again, obviously a difficult situation with whatever played out after the six to seven hour series that was DRX versus D plus Keith. I'll tell you what, their next match is against Gen G. A good showing against that and we will forget about the bro series pretty damn quickly. Yeah, it's going to take a, a rise in form to get that, though, is one of the things I want to mention, right? Making sure of that one. And the big thing that I want to identify heading into that series that needs to be a, a different change up here seems to be really also the read on the meta and on what is going to be and what is going to be the difference makers in the meta to how you can break out of it, how you can have a counter, something like that. I think right now, when you're seeing Kwangdong Freaks, you see these recent struggles, that's an, a, an area that I'm identifying. Then we got a trio of Western squads to close out this first board. Fnatic and FlyQuest both get a bit of a bump with Kwang Dong sliding down. Obviously, none of these squads um, were on the rift, but FlyQuest, Fnatic, and then Mad Lions Koi getting bumped out of that top 10 as other teams climb. I mean, all three of these squads, I think you could say, are a comparable power level. Again, FlyQuest still has so fewer games compared to the two EU squads to go off of. But if you slotted any of these three squads in a head-to-head -head best of right now, I feel like it's close to a toss-up. This is one of those, uh, I'll call it reflection reshuffling of these teams in this situation where you kind of sort them out or keep them in the holding pattern, looking at them and not having these type of games, letting yourself look back on what you saw from them, what impressed you really when we're talking about these games. For Fnatic, for me, it was really about this winter split humanoid, how we hadn't really seen him perform at the top level to start out a year, and it's where you can build from here for him as a player with this confidence in this year. Not talking about the whole career and everything else that you can bring into it. I'm talking about this current form, hot, fresh, and ready. 
that's how you got to keep it if you are someone like humanoid and how you look at yourself at the top level in the lec moving over to the uh, the lcs and talking about our boys fly quest as you mentioned just wanting to see more games we just need more out of the lcs at this point because what we have already seen from FlyQuest has certainly been good enough to warrant this type of spot, warrant the optimism as you look to what they can provide. Whippo returning to the scene, hasn't missed a beat. Inspired, you can say the exact same thing about him, only better because a champion like Diego is still in a busted type of form when you are able to get those reset cities popping off. Jensen has been a stable, solid option in the mid lane and your young guns in the bottom lane. Masu and Buzio are popping off. That is what you want to talk about for FlyQuest. Just need more uh, proof that they are deserving of being that top pillar in the LCS. Obviously, a lot of that depends on how much Cloud9 ends up climbing in this second back half of Spring Split action over in the LCS. Rip it into the top 10 side of things now. We got a squad stand put from where they were last week. And that is, it's we'll call it a three-horse race for dark horses in the LPL. And still at the top is probably... Invictus Gaming sitting pretty at 6-2. and two. Uh, Yes, they did lose a series to World Elite. They needed three games against LGD. But IG and FPX right now are maybe the two most exciting teams in the LPL to watch. And I'm putting them ahead of the top dogs. Oh, and, and what the heck do they got in common? Oh, right. A young jungler leading the charge and being excited. Psychopath jungler, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we can throw that one in there for Mr. Lian and what he's doing in the jungle. Of course, we've talked about Milky Ways before, but Lian really has been this one that I think out of everybody that was kind of looking at this jungle pool in the, in the LPL, I don't think a lot of people saw this type of progression, this leap in potential for a player like Lian, Lian who we have talked about having this available, knowing that this was a possibility, talking about what he could achieve in his career, his type of talent. But then, you know, He's had some struggles in some of these years with IG, a couple of these splits. We're starting to see the progress. We're seeing the signs of life from him, the proactiveness that he's got, the communication, synergy he has with his teammates right now. This is the peak performing jungler in the LPO. And, you know, he was getting it done against his former squad or against a guy he's worked with before in June when they were beaten up on BLG in 2-0 fashion. So very excited to see... A guy like YSKM, too, who completely fell off the map after we were so hyped up against him. But, I mean, pretty much across the board, there's a lot of excitement and legit excitement to be had for this IG squad. Somebody got excited for KT, and that's why they're dropping down uh, to the number nine spot. Uh, this week, they just proved they're not quite at the level of these top dogs in the LCK. And, I mean, really... They had one competitive game against Hanwha Life and then three out of the four others against both T1 and Hanwha. They just got completely gapped. And we're starting to see that this is one heck of a roller coaster built in the world. And if you had already hadn't believed it from the history of the KT organization, you'd believe it with this year because of course you just turned back a couple of short pages ago and you're dismantling Gen G efficiently and clean in your series. And that is where this optimism comes in for the KT Rolster squad. Piosik is rising up as the number one jungler in the LCK. Not the story that we're talking about this week. I think he has individually struggled as things have changed fortunes for this KT Rolster team. It's going to take a lot to rebound at this point, given what we have seen from the top table in the LCK. Yeah, and obviously Peanut, a tough matchup for pretty much every juggler um, in the LCK. Same goes for Owner, but now quietly, Hanwha Life, they have just a single game loss more than both Gen G and T1. I know they got smashed by T1 earlier uh, this split, but against every other matchup they've had so far, they've passed with flying colors. They have. I think it's going to take, though, that matchup, that verification, that check mark against that top level squad like T1. At any point, either, you know, regular split or, of course, even better, even juicier in the playoffs for anybody to give that type of credit to this Hanwha Life team. I think people have been burned, especially a lot of people last year that were trying to be hopeful about what Zekka and Kingen could do for the team. Obviously didn't play out, but with Zekka still there, the, uh, the, the changes that have come in, we have seen it be effectful for this Hanwha Life team to provide enough of an interest and enough firepower to say that they are that question mark team pushing into that top ter territory of the LCK. And it's not the easy, oh my God, get Zekka and Viper a team that you could use last year because 
Well, they got last year's Gen G as the rest of the team, and they're all playing at a pretty high level. So a lot less excuses for this version of Hanwha Life to have here in 2024. Time we finally put the respect on Ninjas in Pajamas to climb up a little bit more because we keep saying, yeah, pretty easy schedule, blah, blah, haven't fully been tested. Yes, they lost to JDG, but listen, they're 7-1. and one. They've only lost five games all split long, and they've got some of the best early game stats in the entire LPL, and what more do you want these guys to do? Oh, and I love to see this come through. We talked about and the only thing that is is holding back the ninjas in pajamas is getting a mega marquee type of victory. They've got some pretty good ones. They've got even, I'll say, a great victory on their schedule. We'll give them that type of credit. But we are waiting for that number one dismantling type of win from them to really get that verification because there were so many question marks heading into this split of exactly what type of product would be coming out from this team. Well, you got the big answer that you really needed in the mid lane rookie. Was he still capable of being one of these elite presence in the mid lane in the LPL? We've seen that so far. And the other big question for me was whether the OMG replacements, these young guys coming over, how they were going to play. Can they step up to not just being, okay, well, you've got some upset potential to being one of these teams that tries to take the front, tries to take those lead reins of the league they're showing that they're ready for that step up so far. Kasanji has only had to play Kasante, you know, because he looks so damn good on that pick. He's completely busted. I feel like we haven't even gotten to see him cook up some spicy top lane picks, which we know he was capable of on OMG. And Aki, the first few series was... He was getting caught out, dying unnecessarily a lot. I think a lot of that has been shored up. The bot lane has been pretty damn consistent. So across the board, you should be feeling very good, like top 10 caliber out of NIP so far. I, I love that you bring up all we've seen him on has been the Cassante so far. A, Cassante broken, and B, he's a pretty good user of that Cassante. is one of those other things you got to give credit over to Shanji. But yes, you go in that history, you look back in the OMG days, we were getting some wild things. You want a Shivana? They're in the top side. My boy Shanji is one of the ones that can cook it up for you in the LPL. Oh my, please play Shivana right now. We've <laughs> we've seen some A-Soul Smolder comps. We need the Shivana top to complete the full dragon comp. Oh, the full dragon synergy. That's where you got to go. And that's where the enemy team then locks in the dragon slayer skin set. Oh, no, not the Pantheon bot lane again. Shades of uh, Griffin way back in 2019. Into the top five, though, we got the same five squads, but a little bit of shuffle going on. Top Esports stays in that five spot despite the disaster Baron call. They still got the best team KDA in the league and the highest gold per minute. They've still been so damn dominant in most of their wins and they make one co nuts completely insane call and they're sitting at six and one and we're feeling extra great about them yes w one call that i will say uh, a healthy 97 out of 100 possible teams in the world would make that call so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna single out top esports as the only ones that would be possible of making that a type of mistake it's not necessarily the club that you want to be in, especially when you're a member of the top five club in the power global power rankings like top esports are. I think one of the things that we do need to give credit for, and one of the things I did mention, Mr. 369 seemed to be the only player with a brain at that moment, figuring out that we got to go back in that one. He's also been one of the major contributors to why this top esports team has found themselves in this type of position as one of the elite threats that represent the LPL. Then you've got, obviously, the massive head-to-head -head BLG, JDG, shaking things up a little bit here. BLG gets the come-from-behind win in Game 3, follows that up with a pretty convincing 2-0, so they get bumped into the 2-spot, leapfrog over Gen G. JDG staying put in the 4-spot, even though they got that series win against World Elite. JDG, quietly, there's still a few question marks. They got the slowest game time in the entire LPL. Flandre continues to get camped every single game. And Yagao, on some picks, hasn't looked super comfortable. Now, I will offer you a couple of little boosts if you are a JDG fan. First, of course, uh, mentioning, as you did say, where this team has been and some of the question marks that you're looking at. Number one, Here's a positive. Flandre, yes, he's gotten all that attention and not in all of it has been great, but he certainly has been better than I think a lot of the expectations were 
given what type of downgrade a lot of people thought this would be for this team and where that would put them. That doesn't necessarily complement this roster as well as a player, as, as rounded and, and, and skilled a player as 369 is. He certainly has been serviceable. The other factor is looking down in the bottom lane, and we were just talking about this maybe a short week ago, looking at, I don't know if I'm really seeing that top elite world-class level gameplay from someone like Ruler down in the bottom lane. Being that difference where I was saying, you know, a year and a half, two years ago, without question to me, the most skilled player in the game in the world at that moment, I think we're starting to see that Ruler show up once again. He's making it quite clear to a lot of people I don't care if the other parts of the team maybe aren't performing or aren't as, as, as much of a threat to you. I'm going to be a bigger threat to you than I was before. And, you know, when he gets to play things like Zaya is when you're fully able to see him take over these games, <laughs> deny people 1v2s, flash forward and completely take over some of these fights. So still feeling great about, uh, about both JDG and BLG. You know, Ben is doing 50,000 damage on Cassante oh, most of the game. Really want to go to the next level about how broken he is. But really, what this list is showcasing, even them going head-to-head, -head, I feel like the gap is widening between T1 and everybody else. T1 continues to impress, and that is the problem for the rest of these four attendees in the VIP section of the Global Power Rankings. Because what do you do? How do you top what show T1 has been bringing out this whole, you know, victory lap run since the World Championship? It's been either, okay, we're going to showcase you the power that we've got in generational talent player Zeus in the top lane. Oh, you wanted a little reminder of what it's been like the last decade plus of the game? We got the unkillable Demon King to style on you in the mid lane. And then we can flip it over to the bottom lane and you want to dibble dabble of some exotic fusion taste coming at you in a meta as stale as a 30 year old bread? Here it is, Guma and Kyria to deliver it. Kyria has more damage per game than every other jungler or support. Jungler or support in the LCK. Yeah, you think he's slowing down with some of these Ezreal picks? Not when he sees those numbers and says, mid laners, I'm coming for you next. And then ADCs, I'm going to be doing more damage than you. But T1 sitting pretty in that top spot still. That's it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark with you. Beauties, thanks for watching. We'll catch you on that flippity flip.